Welcome to the Gospel Activist Podcast, in association with Stepping Out Ministries, where we explore how we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our modern context. Here is your host, pastor and evangelist, Kevin Henry. Hi, this is Pastor Kevin, and welcome back to the Gospel Activist Podcast. Today on the podcast, we'll be looking at the theological doctrine of free will. And uh, that is one of those ones that sometimes raises tensions between certain groups, but it is an important one for us to look at today. Before we look at that content, I want to invite you again to subscribe to our videos on our YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified for when each video is uploaded and or through our website by going to the bottom of our website and sign up for our newsletter. And through our newsletter, you'll also be informed as to when each video is uploaded and other information about the ministry. And so we invite you to sign up for our newsletter and or um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. As we've mentioned, today's content is on free will. And is there such thing as free will? Well, we're going to answer that. But also, how does that relate to the gospel and how does it affect how we share the gospel? Well, first, we need to understand this term free will and what does it mean? Well, the term free will, first of all, is not found in Scripture. However, the idea is clearly found in Scripture. So there's passages that support this idea of free will. Just like the term Trinity, we don't see the term Trinity in the Bible, but we see that doctrine throughout the New Testament. The doctrine of Trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three beings, one God. And that is one of the hard topic to understand sometimes. And uh, we're not going to do that today because we're looking at free will. Again, the language in Scripture does imply that the doctrine of free will does exist and is true. So there's some main points I want to share with you today that speaks to that. So we understand that the, t- the, the doctrine of free will does exist. So there's five points I want to share with you today about free will so we can understand that the doctrine of free will does exist and how does it affect in how we share the gospel. The first point is this, man is responsible for their sin. Romans 3.20 says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So as we see in that verse, it speaks of how we are raised knowledge into understanding because of the law that we are sinners, that we are responsible for our sin. Further, in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This verse in Romans 3.20 imply free will because it speaks of that we have a responsibility to deal with our sin, but not that we can do it on our own, but it is that Jesus does something about our sin, but we must receive his gift of salvation too. When you receive a gift from someone, you, there's still an action. The gift is paid for, is bought for, and is offered to you. But then you must reach out and receive the gift. You must take, it, the, take the gift from hand or pick it up from the person who has intended to give it to you. When you've picked it up or to take it from their hand, you have done an action in receiving that gift. And that takes a choice. The same is true of salvation. Salvation is talked about as a gift that God has freely offered to us through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So, true, we have not obtained salvation on our own merit, on our own works. However, we must choose to receive that gift of salvation because we have a responsibility for our sin. If we didn't have responsibility for our sin, then why would Jesus die for our sins? And further to that, if we are people who don't have free will, we don't have choice, then for God to command to us to not sin and or to receive his gift of salvation would make no sense because we would just be puppets on strings. How could we be accountable for actions that God foreordained for us to do? And we know truly from Scripture that God says that he does not tempt man. So our temptation does not come from God. It comes from somewhere else. It comes from Satan or from our own desire sometimes. 
but we're responsible for our sin. So this speaks to free will, that we have a choice to sin or not to sin based on the power that God gives us. Second point is this. Man is spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Who has blinded the people? Well, in this passage it says, the God of this world. It's not saying that it's God. The God of this world is Satan. And, and by the way, it's not God with a capital G. It's God with a small g. It's referring to Satan here. And so, Yes, we're blinded by something. So then is our is sin our, our choice and problem then? Well, going back to point one, man is responsible for our sins. And because of that, we, uh, when Satan blinds us, there must be prayer from us as Christians to pray that, the, pray that their blinders will be removed so they can see the truth. So does that mean that God ordains people to go to hell? Not at all. I have seen times when I've prayed for people that God will remove their spiritual blindness that over time, their spiritual blindness has been removed and they're able to understand then their plight and sin. So, yes, this verse seems to contradict what we're saying now, but there's still a factor in it that, that we are to pray then that spiritual blindness is removed from those who are still lost. Third point is this, God does the calling. I think Calvinism is correct in this, is that, that God does the calling, that God does the pursuing but we forget that we still have free will in this. Romans eleven twenty nine says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. This gift is the gift of salvation. The calling is the call to salvation. So one might wonder and say, Well, when do I know God is calling me into faith? Well, one, it might be when someone shares the gospel with you. Or when you have the realization that God does exist. The question then comes then, well, what about those who have never heard of God? Well, in Romans, it talks about too that God has left a witness of himself so that no man, no person is without excuse. Creation is part of that. God has put an inherent knowledge in us that he exists and that we must pursue him. So God does give us the calling to every single person. We see elsewhere that God desires it all to be saved. But we still have the choice to receive that gift of salvation or not. God gives the calling. It is for you to receive that calling. Next point is that God clears our vision. This again speaks to the second point that God, man is spiritually blind, but God can give clear vision. Because he gives that calling, he gives clear vision for us to see the calling, to hear the calling. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and verse 18 is the key here, but we're going to read this so you have more of an understanding of the context of verse 18. Beginning again in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks to you, for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And that is the measurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he re when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is, his, that is named. For only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So I mentioned the key verse here is verse 18. I'll read that verse to you again. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Again, that is key. 
eyes of your hearts enlightened. If God doesn't enlighten your hearts, spiritual blindness can't be removed. And so it's the work that God does and does for everyone. Um, in his good time, though, by the way, further, that you may know, again, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So you have a hope that God has called you to. It's, it's not a hope that we, we desire to happen, but a hope that is realized in that the hope that we will someday be in heaven with Jesus because we know that he died for our sins, that he has forgiven us of our sins when we have confessed our sins because God's word tells us that if we call upon him, he will save us. So God clears our vision so we can hear the call, so we can see the call that God has given to us. Lastly, we receive the gift. I referred to this already. Again, when you are given a gift, you have to receive it. You have to, there's still action that you do. And the, the doctrine of election, when it goes to the extreme of saying that, no, you don't do anything at all. It's all what God has done. Yes, Christ did the work of salvation because we cannot do that work on our own. However, it is a, a, an action that we still must do. We must choose to receive his gift of salvation. Romans 5, 11. More that. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Received. Again, there's an action that you have to be able to take what is given to you. So we do see that in Scripture that even though it doesn't use the term free will, we do see that we have free will. Why would God tell us you must receive this gift of salvation? That if you call upon in your name, you will be saved. Call upon him. Again, that's an action that we do. We call upon him for salvation. We're receiving his gift of salvation. Again, we're not saying that you are saved by your own actions, but what Christ has done, but it's an actualization, realization, and then a receiving of that gift because we have to choose to receive the gift. So when someone hears the, go the gospel, in that moment, they need to make a choice. Are they going to receive the gift of salvation or are they not? Or later on, as, as, as God convicts them again further, they need to choose to either receive the gift or not to. So we have the free will, the choice to receive the gift of God. And again, it is his desire that we must receive his gift of salvation. There's the question that some say, though, but what about God when he hardens people's hearts? Well, when we see people like, for instance, Pharaoh in the Old Testament, when God hardens his heart, it wasn't very hard for him to harden his heart because Pharaoh's heart was somewhat hard against Israel already. And it was about pride for him. Pride that he had all these workers, all these slaves to do his bidding. Yes, God can stir one's heart to hardness. But especially again, when one's heart is prideful already. And yes, it is for God's purpose. It doesn't mean that God's being mean, um, but we still have the opportunity too that people can repent. Even Pharaoh, after that, after the tenth plague, he could have decided not to pursue the Israelites. After he could have repented too, and remember in in the Old Testament it says too that that God allowed this to happen so that Pharaoh, that Pharaoh and the Egyptians can see that he is the one true God. Even that was being used to try, try to draw the Egyptian people to him. Again, it shows God's love. God can harden someone's heart, but he still gives them the opportunity, the chance to repent still. Judas, again, too, even though he betrayed Jesus, you could see that he felt bad that he did wrong, and he went back to the, to the priests, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and said, here, take back your blood money. I've done wrong. What does he do next? He chooses to go and hang himself instead. He could have re repented. Well, one might say that, well, what, what about the prophecies about Judas, about the field that he would die in? And, and true, there's the prophecies, but the thing about those prophecies is that God was telling us what was going to take place. Again, God allows us to have free choice. God could have prophesied if he foresaw and foreknew what was going to happen. And that's the key. God foreknew what was going to take place. Yes, we don't have access to that knowledge except for where God has given prophecies in his word. However, 
He foresaw what Judas would choose to do. Did he will Judas to, to hang himself? No. Because God's word tells us that he wills that all should be saved. It's his desire that we should all be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in 1 Peter as well. So the doctrine of free will, of choice, does exist. We see it implied throughout Scripture. And it is important for each one of us to choose to receive God's gift of salvation. Here's some other things to consider about free will. First of all, faith and love equally are a choice thing. You can't be you can't be forced to love someone. Love has to be a choice. And God calls us to love him. So if God made us to be puppets of saying that you don't have a choice, then we truly can't love God because love is a choice. Faith too is a choice because it is belief in action. We can believe something but choose not to act upon it. So if we believe that Jesus is our Savior, we can act upon that by saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and I surrender my life to you. That is faith. Faith, again, takes choice. Both of those terms insinuate choice. And then again, love is an action based on affection for another. If we truly love God, it has to do with looking at him and saying, Lord, I'm so thankful for what you have done. I have affection towards you because you have shown your affection towards me in your sacrifice on the cross. So love and faith, again, insinuate choice. And we see throughout Scripture that God gives us choice. Why else would God say to you, repent? Repent from your sins if you couldn't choose to repent. The Joshua, even in the Old Testament, says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We see throughout Scripture that there's free will, that God, yes, wills us to be saved. And yes, not all do, because not all choose to be saved. So now that we understand free will, how does this affect the gospel and how we share the gospel? Well, it's this. Anyone can come to faith in Jesus Christ as he calls them into relationship with him. And he does call all people. Jesus offers the gift of salvation, and one then chooses to receive this gracious gift. So what must we communicate when we share the gospel in regards to free will? Again, we don't necessarily need to use the term free will. We can use terms like choice. But we must communicate two things. One first is God is calling you to receive the gift of salvation. We must communicate that. God is calling that the sinner to come to faith. And two, you must choose to believe Confess and surrender to Jesus in faith. It is very important for us to do to communicate that. That they must choose then, hopefully in that moment, to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to confess their sins and surrender their lives to Him. I would love to interact with you further on this topic. And so here's a question that I would love to see you inter interact with you in the comments below. Again, whether it be on our YouTube channel or our website both places have interaction places for comments and so here's the question for us to interact with together how has the doctrine of free will changed your understanding of salvation i want to thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today and again as i said earlier i want to remind you to subscribe to our youtube channel by hitting the subscribe button and hitting the, the bell so you get notifications and or by going to our website, steppingoutministries.com, and signing up for our newsletter at the bottom of the page. Maybe you're one, though, who is like, I don't want to necessarily interact online, but I still have some questions. I would like to interact with you on this question and this topic today. You can do so through our email, and there's a link in the description down below for my our email address. And also with that, maybe you have a question you'd like me to answer on the podcast. I would love to interact with you in that way as well. You can send that through our email address. Maybe you're one who's been enjoying these podcasts as well and have been challenged and encouraged in the faith and how to share the gospel. And so maybe you're wondering about how can we support the ministry? Uh, this ministry does take finances to run. And as I've said in other videos so far, so far it's been out of my own pocket. 
And uh, these days are a little bit more tough these days as I don't have regular income. And so we do need help in order to keep the podcast running and our website running. And so you can do so in two ways. You can send an e-transfer to the email address linked below, or you can go to our Patreon page and pledge to support the ministry on a monthly basis. And through Patreon, there's just a, a base amount that you can where it's $5 Canadian a month, which would help us greatly. And there's other tiers that unlocked other ways to just a, a way of saying thanks for your support financially. And one of those things is a monthly uh, interactive with me online where you can talk with me face to face online and ask any question you may have about evangelism and apologetics. Either way, I want to thank you so much for supporting us at Stepping Out Ministries. And another way to support us is by sharing about us and uh, sending out some of these videos to others and links to our website and YouTube channel. Next time on the program, we'll be looking at the topic of sovereignty. Now, when Calvinists and Arminians disagree on this, who's right? Uh, and what about those who are in the middle of the spectrum of these two doctrines, uh, of these both ideologies? How does it affect sovereignty? And how does our view of sovereignty affect how we share the gospel? We'll be looking at that next week on the program. Until next time, this is Pastor Kevin reminding you to share the gospel to any person, anywhere, anytime, and at no matter the cost. You have been listening to the Gospel Activist Podcast in association with Stepping Out Ministries. To submit a comment or question for Pastor Kevin to answer on the podcast, visit us at www.steppingoutministries.com. Thank you for listening, and we invite you to join us for our next podcast.